On November 9, 1985, Danny Paquette was standing outside of his barn behind his home welding a tractor. Call 911, go! They heard a loud crack. And while they described it as a gunshot, everybody was convinced at that point he was electrocuted. He was welding. The welding torch was still running. By all indications, it was an industrial accident. It was an electrocution after all. Just tell me exactly what happened. The scene was very crowded very quickly. Danny's brother, Victor, was called. We need to back up. We have an active crime scene. Okay, okay I, relax, I, relax. One of the cops on the scene was a brand new officer, Steve Agrafiotis. He was a rookie. Steve Agrafiotis at the police department. At the time, it's 12, 23 hours. I was the department photographer at the time. I was called out to start documenting the scene, which ultimately turned into a crime scene. See, so the bulldozer the victim was working on. This was the electrical connection from the well on the ground to the tractor. On the ground, one of the first witnesses on the scene drew an outline of, the, of where the body was found. They started looking around and trying to figure out where a bullet could have come from. The tree line for the woods was hundreds of yards away. Standing on the bulldozer, looking north to the area where it's believed the shot was fired from. It was the first day of deer hunting season, so their first theory was that a stray bullet had come from the woods. A deer hunter made a miraculous shot through this very small space and hit Danny right in the chest. It was a hunting accident. I live in the town where Danny Paquette died. And when I was asked once to, when I had this opportunity to write a major national article, what story would you want to tell? This was the first story that popped into mind. A great crime story usually starts with somebody deciding that somebody has to die. The way that the police had to have unraveled the plan to catch who did it, it's the most fascinating story I've ever written about. So at the beginning, we thought that the possibility of a hunting accident was unlikely. So first order of business was to look into Danny's background. So the state police would assign people to go out, talk to different people, or visit different places to gather information. We learned very quickly that Danny had a lot of enemies. There were some rough characters in Hooksit. Danny Paquette and his brother were among the rough characters. Tell your boy here he needs to pay his debt. There were a lot of potential suspects. There were bikers involved. Hey, guys, take off. You ever come back to this property again? I'll cut your heart out. Did a bad business decision play into Danny's death? Some other dispute that we weren't aware of? We'll see how this plays out. Yeah, we will. Danny's brother was also kind of a bad guy. He was into drugs. He also had a lot of women in his life. There was a theory that Victor had been the intended target. Hey, babe. Come back to bed, huh? Danny had an extensive, at the time, it used to be called a little black book. But for him, you could probably call it a pretty big black book. Ma! It's JJ. Oh, what is he doing here? Don't do anything, don't do anything. Danny had uh, many female friends. He made some enemies because at times he would date some married women. Danny, open that door. No, 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 no. No, it's my. Let me handle this, okay? It's my son. Danny, I know my ma's in there. Go home. Ma, I know you're in there. Danny, you need to go home. Get your hands off me, Danny. I'm not leaving until my ma comes out here. Your ma is a big girl. And she's ma, are you in there? Right now. Ma, go home. Get your hands off of me. Go I'm home. not leaving here until my mom's with me. Oh my God. No, 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 you can't. No. 
You get back in the house. Shortly before Danny was killed, he actually had a fight in the front yard of his home with the son of a woman he was dating. Now keep in mind, this wasn't Danny's only girlfriend. Danny was married when he was quite young. She left him because he was abusive. The divorce got very, very ugly. He began to stalk her. He began to threaten her. He ended up in court, and in court, he lunged at the judge. He was sentenced to go to a psychiatric unit. One day when he was 13 years old, Danny stayed home from school because his mother was supposed to take him to a dentist appointment. He woke up late. He couldn't find her anywhere in the house. They found Danny and Victor's mother's body burnt to a crisp in a pigsty. Victor and Danny's mother knew a little too much about a series of murders that were happening in Manchester, New Hampshire, and that she said she knew who had committed them. And she turned up dead. When Danny was murdered in 1985, Victor was certain it was connected to their mother's death. As part of the investigation, of course, not only suspects, but family members, everybody was asked what their whereabouts. Thanks for coming in. Danny had a stepdaughter, Melanie Paquette. She was actually his adopted daughter with his ex-wife, Denise. You said you were in Plymouth, right? Mm-hmm. Mm, what were you doing in Plymouth? I was um, watching a field hockey game. Go! She was at a field hockey game for her local high school's championships in Plymouth, New Hampshire. Woo! And she was at that field hockey game with her good friend, Eric Winhurst. He's somebody that everybody knew. He came from a fairly prominent family. The police went and questioned Eric about the alibi. He confirmed it. Yeah! He had, in fact, been at the field hockey game that day with Melanie. Every morning, we would have a meeting of all the investigators and the support officers. We were expecting to get our daily briefing and daily assignments. We were told, to our surprise, that the state police had decided that the case was a hunting accident and that the investigation was going to be suspended. Despite the fact that a lot of Danny's associates believed he'd been murdered, the police weren't convinced that somebody could have made that shot. It had to have been a stray bullet, a miraculous shot that hit Danny in the chest because nobody could have made that shot on purpose. By sheer luck, the bullet was found. A couple of days after Danny was shot, neighbors in his neighborhood started complaining that their phones weren't working. The phone company was called, and a lineman who was working on the telephone lines behind Danny's house saw an anomaly in the rubber coating of the telephone line. He ended up bringing his little cherry picker up to the line, looking at it very closely, dug with a tool in the line, and pulled out a bullet. They were able to determine the caliber of the rifle that had shot Danny Paquette, and it wasn't a caliber of rifle people were using for hunting. The bullet was able to be identified as a 270 rifle caliber. We were able to rule out that somebody had been in close proximity to Danny. There had been some speculation that it was a hunting accident. Some of the investigators thought that was plausible. Many of us did not think that was plausible. We honestly felt that it was a deliberate shot and that if somebody took that type of a shot, they had to have a lot of skill. So they were either very motivated or they were somebody that had been hired. For a lot of people in Hooksit, Danny's death was written off as good riddance because he was a troublemaker. That probably played a part in them not pursuing it past the hunting accident. 
It was very hard for us to understand why, at the point we were at, the case was going to be stopped. We, in our minds, had not reached a dead end. Sir, 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 I need you to back up. We got an active crime scene here. Danny, Danny's my brother. Victor okay, knew okay. from day one that his brother had been murdered. Every year, Victor would call the police and Hooksit and say, where are you on solving my brother's case? He wasn't going to give up. In 1992, the case came alive again. Danny's brother received two anonymous letters, both of which pointed to Eric Winhurst as the murderer of Danny Paquette. One of them detailed that Eric had been the shooter, what kind of rifle he'd used, and also said that everyone in town was keeping the secret for him. You wanted more proof. Police then took what they heard from the letters. They went to question Eric Winhurst. He was living in Colorado at the time, so they ended up talking to his parents. His parents said that this was just rumor and innuendo that had been swirling around town, and they told Eric not to speak to police. His parents gave the police Eric's 270 caliber hunting rifles, but when the ballistics came back and they realized the shot that killed Danny came from a different rifle, it ended up ruling out Eric Winhurst. The police also sent Melanie a questionnaire about the letters. As she was living in California, she was newly married. She had converted to Mormonism. She filled it out partially, and she said, just a rumor, and mailed it back. The police decided they had nothing further to go on, and the case once again went cold. In November of 1999, I was hired as the police chief in Hooksit, New Hampshire. So I went back to my hometown as chief, and one of the things I told uh, my potential bosses when I was being interviewed was, if possible, I would like to go back and revisit that case. The victim's brother, Victor Paquette, every year around the anniversary of Danny's death, he would call all the departments that had been involved in the investigation and ask for a status. And Victor, of course, was very frustrated because he got the same story year after year, which didn't amount to anything. It's time to reopen the case, Chief. What bothered me about that case and what motivated me was that, number one, it was a uh, major crime that hadn't been solved. And number two, I honestly didn't feel that we had tracked down every lead because those letters had identified a suspect. And the suspect's name had come up in the initial interviews. And I really felt that, you know, we really had a lot more work to do in this case to reach the point that we could look people in the eye, especially Victor Paquette, and say, we did our jobs. And we could not do that. Nearly two decades after Danny's murder, Steve Agrafiotis is now chief of the Hooks of Police, and he reopens the investigation into Danny's murder. He hires a civilian investigator with extra funds that the department has. His name is Bill Shackford. I knew of Bill's reputation of being an excellent investigator. He was to independently look at the case from the beginning and follow that case and any leads in whatever direction it may take. There are three words I learned when I was very early in my police career. Observation, not judgment. Shackford opens the files for this case. He sees things that, for some reason, other people have missed. After I read the files, about 1,500 pages, I saw that there was many areas that had been covered real well. A lot of good police work had gone into this case. But I noticed there were some areas that were kind of weak and needed some attention. I think when we reopened the investigation, I was a little surprised when Bill told me that the way that the investigators had handled the anonymous letters uh, was a little bit unusual. We really had to get back to square one, and we were starting fresh. You keep on digging. You just keep on turning over the rocks to see what comes out. One night, I woke up in the middle of the night, and I said the word alibi. And I says, alibi has, was never checked out. And so 
the next day, I started working on the alibi. The New Hampshire Athletic Association keeps a record of every high school and college game. So I went to them and I says, this is what I've got and what I'm looking at. Could you go back in your archives to 1985? And the director there said, no problem. He says, I can do that. He says, they played a field hockey game and this is the score and Hopkinton won. But he says, I see a note here in the records that the game was held up. And so uh, the game did not start till one o'clock and it finished it at near two o'clock. This was not correct with what Eric and Melanie had said in their alibi, that they had gone to the field hockey game and that they got home by one o'clock. Well, I thought about the crime scene itself. If they were coming over here, where would they park their car? Being a patrolman in Hooksett, I knew that near a, a pond called Doobie's Pond, there was a turnout. While we were there, a young lady appeared on the scene, and she introduced herself as a member of the Doobie family, which lives adjacent to the pond. It was stopped right over there in the cutaway. And I remember thinking, why in heaven would anyone be stopped there? Do you recall what kind of car it was? Yeah, it was a black BMW. And I remember the license plate. It was covered with mud, even though the road wasn't that wet or muddy at all. Going back to the records, Eric Windhurst drove that type of a car. Where Danny was standing was not close to where somebody could have shot him with a rifle without him seeing them. Standing on the bulldozer, looking north to the area where it's believed the shot was fired from. He was standing in front of a very big field. The tree line, however, was a few hundred yards away. It was very unlikely that a high school teenager could have made that shot. It was a miraculous shot. It had to be somebody that had a, the ability to fire a rifle with the accuracy to hit the victim in the heart. So I went over to the Hopkinton Police Department and I spoke with the dispatcher over there and I've known her for years. And she says to me, Bill, she says, you ought to talk to one of our officers, Bill Thompson. He may have something that he could share with you. So how did you know Eric? Eric and I grew up in the same neighborhood. Our families were friends. Our dads were friends. We went to school together. Spent a lot of time with him. Yeah. Parties, girls, hunting, fishing, all that stuff. Hunting? Yeah, hunting. He says he's a nut about guns like I am, so we had a lot in common. Do you recall uh, what kind of gun Eric had? Actually, yeah, I do. A 270 rifle. Springfield? No, nope, Ruger. Hmm. He tells Shackford that Eric used to make his own ammunition in the basement of his house for his hunting rifle, a 270 caliber hunting rifle he had received as a gift from his father. What kind of shot was he? Eric was the best shot I've ever seen, actually. That gave me my first lead that possibly I'm looking in the right direction. Shackford blows the case wide open. Now Eric Winhurst is indeed a suspect. The missing link, the only person who could turn this case, is Melanie Paquette. In 1985, Melanie Paquette was the new girl. She had just moved to town from Alaska. She was shy, definitely a bit of a tomboy. Some help with that? No, I'm fine. Oh, did you just uh, move in around here? Yeah, we actually just moved next door. Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm uh, I'm Eric. 
Hey, um, it's nice to meet you. I'm Melanie. Pleasure to meet you, too. Yeah. Well, I'm sure I'll be running into you more often. Yeah, hopefully I'll get to see you soon. Absolutely. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice meeting you. Eric Winhurst was very good looking, the kind of guy that likes to be liked. When she moved to town, he took her under his wing immediately. Soccer had always really been Melanie's outlet, and she was very, very skilled at it. <laughs> Eric Winhurst was this very handsome and dynamic captain of the boys' soccer team. There was no girls' soccer team in Hopkinton, New Hampshire, so she tried out for the boys' team. It was something that was against the rules. She had practiced playing with bare feet when she was a kid, so one of the tricks she used to show the boys in the Hopkinton team was she would take off her cleats and handle the ball with her bare feet, and they were very impressed with that. Where did that come from? <laughs> he and a couple of the other boys recognized that she could really play. They helped champion her cause with the school, and she ended up playing on the team with the boys. After that stretch. Oh, my, my thigh actually does hurt. She was just somebody he liked spending time with and that he really felt for. Get a little wet right there. Yeah. The water. Perfect. All right. All right. I think we, I think we got the water. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's no doubt that Melanie was infatuated with Eric Winhurst, but the feelings weren't mutual. While Melanie was writing home to her mother about her crush on Eric Winhurst, he really saw Melanie as more of a little sister. And the fact that Melanie had a crush on him made him want to be friends with her even more, even though he didn't return her feelings. Hey, Melanie. What's the moment in? Yeah. Yeah, cool. Thanks. No worries. Are you all right? What people in her new town of Hopkinton didn't know, though, was that she was actually living in hiding from her stepfather, Danny Paquette. I'm here, though. I'm here for you. No, I know. I know. I don't. <laughs> it's like it's so silly telling someone out loud, you know? It feels like it was so long ago. <laughs> there was a custody dispute going on as far as Melanie and an adoption issue coming up. Danny didn't know that, that Melanie was in the state of New Hampshire, and the relatives that were trying to adopt Melanie had petitioned the court to keep Danny out of the adoption proceedings. However, the court had ruled that Danny had a right to know that she was in the state and had a right to speak his piece. So obviously there was a lot of family tension going on. Danny Paquette had gone through a very ugly divorce from her mother. She had accused him of molesting her, and she was afraid if he found out that she was in the state, he would kill her. So she was actually living with relatives in this town about 30 minutes away from where Danny lived. I don't even know if I should really talk about it, honestly, but... She told them a story about her stepdad, Danny Paquette, having molested her for years. He had held a gun in her mouth. He had killed animals in front of her. And she was very worried he was about to find out where she was. Eric, you don't know what it feels like. Eric Winhurst had only known Melanie a short time, but he cared about her very much. Sometimes I feel like he's going to come for me. Melanie, listen. What? I'm going to take care of this, all right? The seed was planted for Eric. He wanted to rise to the occasion. He wanted to save her. Melanie, you're like my little sister, all right? I'm going to take care of you. <laughs> he saw her being failed by all of the adults in her life, and he thought, maybe I can do something to solve this problem. Shortly after that, Eric would ask Melanie, you know, do you really want me to take care of your stepfather? Yeah. I just don't know that we should do anything. Now you want to back out? And Melanie said, what are you talking about? You're not Rambo. Like, what would you think you would do? I'm going to take care of the situation. It seemed at face value like a, just a teenage outburst than a serious plan. But in fact, Eric had deeper motivations to help kill Danny Paquette. Our thought was that we needed to find out from Melanie if she would talk to us exactly what happened. 
And one of the things we learned is that she had become very religious and was very involved with her church and the community. And we felt that that might be a very strong motivator for her to finally tell us what had happened. Had she given us an alibi that was false? Had she been telling the truth and there was other information we didn't have? Um, there was still a lot of different directions it could go. The detectives were able to convince the state of New Hampshire to invest in them, taking a trip to Idaho to visit Melanie. And on a very hot July day, they knocked on her door. Can I help you? Melanie Cooper? Yes. And there she is. She's the same girl that they recognize from all these pictures from 1985. She still looks incredibly youthful. Mrs. Cooper, I'm Detective William Shackford from Hookset, New Hampshire. We're here to talk to you about the Danny Pocket case. Can I help you? Melanie Cooper? Yes. Mrs. Cooper, I'm Detective William Shackford, and I'm from Hookset, New Hampshire. And there she is. She's the same girl that they recognize from all these pictures from 1985. She still looks incredibly youthful, and she agrees to go with them to the local police department to answer questions. M-E-L-A-N-I-E? -E. Mm -hmm. Okay, not Y. No. Cooper, C-O-O-P-E-R? Okay. One of the officers who knew about how religious Melanie was confronted her. You're a human being just like I am. Mm -hmm. We all make mistakes. We all wish we could turn back the hands of time. I wish I could do that. I know I'm going to be redeemed because I have a strong faith in the man upstairs. Mm -hmm. And I know when I die where I'm going. And I know that I'm forgiven for all that I've, been, that I've done in my past. But it still doesn't prevent me from feeling guilty about some of the things that I've done in my life. Do you feel like you can be 100% truthful today? Or do you feel like you can't be? Can I just have a moment alone? Just sure. to, I want to say a prayer and just okay, would you like work to something out. That'd be great. Okay, would, you, would you just get a knock on the door and let me know? Okay, time to come all right. Back the police left her alone in the room, but they could see her on a closed circuit camera next door, and they could see her grappling with something. They could see her struggling. And when they came back in the room, I'll tell you everything. what was going to happen. Moore saw it as an opportunity to spend time with him, I guess. I didn't believe that he could really do that. What do you hunt out here? Deer. No way. No, yeah, there's tons of deer. That's awesome. Somewhere in there was a trail. We just followed it. And it came up behind the old stone wall. Why don't you sit down? There was a stone wall in the woods. If Eric just walked from that stone wall straight along a path, he'd be on the edge of Danny Paquette's property. I'm gonna do it when the flavor goes out of my gum.
then I heard the shot. And I don't know, I just couldn't believe it. Melanie, let's go. Let's go, let's go. Come on. Come on, He came running. And then I kept asking him, did you get him? Did you get him? Because I didn't know if he had been seen and he was just running, like he just shot off into the space and if Danny was going to be chasing us. And I was so afraid that I was going to see Danny chasing after us down the thing. And I kept asking him, did, did you get him? Did you shoot him? And he just kept saying, turn around, run backwards, run backwards, watch behind us. Just stay down, stay down, please. What happened? Stop, all Can right? Can you do something Shut to up. Me? Shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. What happened? I need to know. I shot him, all right? I shot him. It's done. It's over. All right? I finished it. It's done. In the room, you could hear a pin drop. They know this is her confession. They know this is the real story. Stay down. Stay, stay down. They saw police cars and ambulances driving to the property, and when they passed those cars, Eric pushed her down and said, stay out of sight. He was still protecting her even as they drove away from the scene. When I saw the ambulances, that was the first time that it really sunk in. That he really did just do it. But I still thought that he'd be alive. I didn't think that he'd be dead. They then asked her if she'll do something for them. Don't be too concerned. But I'm going to ask you to make a phone call to Eric Winters. And I want no, to I don't, I don't want to. Please. Listen. No, please. It, just, hear, just hear me out. I'm going to tell you, let me, just, just hear me out. Don't, before you turn me down, just listen to what I've got to say. It was still going to take more than just Melanie's word at that point to continue the legal process. She was telling us the story, but we needed the evidence to, to have a court case. We need you to call Eric Winhurst, and we need to tape the conversation. He needs to tell you the same story that you just told us. You played soccer, lady. You know what I'm talking about. You need to just kick the ball. That ball's rolling right now, and we've got to get it in that net. Because Eric, you didn't think he was going to do it. He went and did this, and he took another person's life, and he had no right to it. She was terrified. She was very, very worried that he would know why she was calling. They had talked on and off throughout the years before. They had never talked about it. They had agreed they would never talk about it. <laughs> Here was somebody who had acted on her behalf, had protected her, had kept the secret for two decades, had always wished her well. And how here she was being asked to turn on him. Hello, is this Eric? This is. Eric, this is um, Melanie Puckett. Don't be too concerned. But I'm going to ask you to make a phone call to Eric Winters. And I'm going to no, I don't, I don't want to. Please. Listen. No, please. It, just, hear, just hear me out. I'm going to tell you, let me, just, just hear me out. Don't, before you turn me down, just listen to what I've got to say. The police set Melanie up with Eric's cell phone number and a telephone in a room. They had permission to tap the call. She made the phone call, and Eric picked up the phone. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. No, nah, things are good for me out here. He was really surprised. He thought she was just calling to say hello. They hadn't spoken in a couple of years. Uh-huh. Did he really? Ah, good for him. Well, you know, you got five boys now. It's kind of, uh, <laughs> you got a lot on your plate. But then she said to him, Eric, I'm worried. I've been contacted by investigators, and they say they know what we did, and I don't know what to do. OK. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's a good idea for you to be talking to them about this. Not at all. No, it was 20 years ago. You know, I told everybody the same thing. You know, I went to the school hockey game like that. I don't know how anybody knows. Why are you so calm about it? Why? Yes. Why am I calm about it? Yes, I'm not calm. I know, I know you. that. I'm not calm about this. I don't have a calm feeling. I don't feel like this is working out. I feel like... For some reason, whatever it is, this many years down the road, they must have something. Melanie, during their back and forth conversation, said to Eric, I'm just going to tell them the truth, meaning the police. What happens if I just tell them the truth? Well, then you go to jail. 
The thing that's interesting about that first phone call, Melanie was talking about how guilty she felt, was talking about wanting to tell after all these years what finally happened. This is a person whose life was on the line all of a sudden. His first reaction wasn't, don't tell, don't tell. His first reaction was, protect yourself. Well, you're gonna have to hire a lawyer to see it through the end. To protect your family and yourself. Once again, Eric Winhurst was Melanie's protector. He was her big brother. He was giving her objectively good advice to protect herself, to call a lawyer, to shield herself from what could happen to her life. No, I, you know, frankly, I, I don't care. What do you mean you don't care? Let's do whatever they, they have to to me, OK? You know what? I don't have children. <laughs> I'd rather see you safe and protect and forget about me. Oh, hell or high water, no matter what, you come first. A grand jury was convened, and enough evidence mounted against Eric Winhurst for there to be an arrest. He still didn't know the police had tapped the calls, but he knew something was going to happen. He didn't know how much time he had left before the police caught up to him. And he woke up every day wondering if this could be the day. Less than a year later, he was actually working on a very high-end home project, and he sees an unmarked police car pull up in front of the house. And he said, they're here for me, and climbs down the ladder. I think you know why we're here. Yeah. Eric Winhurst. I'm arresting you for the murder of Danny Popcat. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be held against you in the court of law. When he was taken into custody, it was almost as if he was expecting it. Eric Winhurst was not helped by dozens of people keeping his secret. They felt like they were protecting him just the same way he felt like he was protecting Melanie. If the alibi had fallen apart right away, if the lies hadn't been told right away, he would have gone to trial when he was a teenager, and the outcome would have been very different. The attorney general's office, whenever they would talk about the case, what they would hear is, why are you putting this guy in jail? He was a pillar of his community. He was well-liked. He was well-respected. He killed a child molester. Even the prosecutors wondered how they were going to make this case in court that Eric deserved to go to jail. A lot of people to this day believe that Eric still had a really good chance of getting off. But Eric, he wasn't willing to put his friends, his family, in that position. Eric pled guilty. When faced with the choice to protect even more people, he sacrificed himself once again. To shoot someone you've never met from a distance, it doesn't get more deliberate than that. And for that, the defendant, Eric Winhurst, will serve a sentence of a minimum of 15 years and a maximum of 36 years. The police made a deal with Melanie because of her cooperation that she wouldn't see any jail time. She would be known as a convicted felon, but her sentence would be suspended as long as she was of good behavior. A number of investigators testified on Melanie's behalf and how we might not have had a case if it was not for her. She was fully expecting to get on a plane that night and go home to her children back in Idaho. Melanie Cooper, I understand you suffered a lot before this tragedy. But for me to accept everything you say about that day's events is just too much. And what the judge said was, I don't believe you. I don't believe that you sat on a wall while your friend went and shot Danny Paquette. I believe that someone had to point out who he was, and I believe that person was you. I have real difficulty accepting that at some point, the lights didn't go on in your head. I reject your argument for a suspended sentence. You will serve three to six years in state prison with no possibility of an appeal. Bailiff, take them away. Eric Winhurst is kind of a white knight to a lot of people. You know, he's a white knight who fell on his sword in defense of a maiden. Behind bars, Eric is still acting as Melanie's protector. When I asked him, did she point out who it was that you needed to shoot? He says this, I know what happened, she knows what happened. What good would it do her 
for me to tell you anything other than what she told the police. This is a story of people with complicated lives who are dealing with their own demons and their own problems. Arguably, the worst person in the story was the victim, which makes it so much more complicated. The truth is always hanging out there somewhere. Just somebody's going to come along and, and stumble over it. It was a strange story. I started off as a patrol officer when the incident occurred, and I was a chief of police when Eric was arrested. Um, a lot of history between that. I think the only regret I have in this case is that the police didn't follow it through much sooner because we were extremely lucky to get the results we did, thanks to Melanie. If it wasn't for Melanie, the case probably wouldn't have been solved. hope someday that some 17 year old hears the story and thinks maybe I won't make the easy decision maybe I'll make the tough one and tell somebody Hi.